projectors or whatever time of day it is for you there. We are delighted today to have human design wizard Karen Curry Parker on the Projector Movement podcast. Karen's been working in human design virtually since the beginning of human design. And over the years, she's brought her own deep insight and mutation into the field of human design, creating her own system called quantum human design, which maybe she'll tell us a little bit about. She's one of the world's leading human design teachers and the best-selling author in human design, a TEDx speaker, and has been teaching, speaking, and coaching clients and training students for over three decades. She's also the host of the Quantum Conversations and Quantum Human Design podcast and co-founder of Grace Point Publishing. Karen is a 4-6 manifesting generator, or what is called in quantum human design, a time bender, which I definitely want to hear a little bit more about. So welcome, Karen. Um, I know I described you as a wizard, but I'm curious how you would describe yeah, yourself. I was like, I don't, I don't think anybody's ever called me a wizard before. Maybe Speedy Gonzalez, but that's about it. (laughs) But I don't get a lot of respect in my house. So, (laughs) so how how would you describe yourself? And I know you're you're an originator in the human design space, um, and we're so grateful to have you on the podcast here. Um, Would you like to say a little bit about um, your own position in the field, and how how would you describe what what you do? just opening it up for you. Mm, that That's a really, uh, that's a big question. Um, I don't think I, I literally don't think I've ever thought about that question before. Um, <laughs> you know, I like to think of myself as the human design mom. Um, that's probably the best way of putting it. Uh, you know, I've, I first encountered human design in late 1999 um, my first husband at the time, who was a no motors projector, um, went on a spiritual retreat to Sedona, Arizona, probably because, you know, between the two of us, we had four children, two manifesting generators, two generators. So he had to leave a lot. <laughs> um, so <laughs> he um, went to Sedona. We, I was a, we were living in the suburbs of Houston, Texas at the time. He brought back a chart. I looked at the chart and, and some of you've maybe had this experience. It just like, it hit me. Like I can still remember that feeling of like the chart, like smacking me in the soul. And I just started to cry. And I was like, I have to know everything about this. And at that time you could submit your information to have it run manually. Um, and you had to wait a couple of days to get the email back. And I, I, of course thought for sure I was a manifester because who doesn't. Right. And, um, (laughs) got my chart back and it was a manifesting generator. And I just continued to cry. Like, well, what does that mean? Am I manifester? I'm a non-manifester was a generator. I have to wait. Who, who waits? I don't wait. You know, it was a big confusing thing, but I, I just knew like, I have to go learn everything about it. So we put our house on the market within days, we sold it within two weeks. We packed everybody up, moved across the country to Sedona, uh, where the headquarters at the time for human design was. Um, As soon as we got there, my youngest son had an ear infection and uh, I went to the pediatrician's office and came out of the pediatrician's office with this toddler on my hip. And in the hallway across the door from the pediatrician's office was a door that had the human design mandala on it. And I thought, well, I'll just go in here. Um, So I walked in with this kid on my hip and there was this giant desk and this little lady behind the desk. And she said, did you come for the job? And I said, yeah, I did. (laughs) And so then she hired me there on the spot. Um, And that was at at that time, the headquarters for human design America. This was pre-Jovian. Uh, So it it was, you know, I got to work there. I got to study everything that was, you know, available. And of course, had the privilege of learning personally from Ra and, you know, uh, kind of helping support him on a teaching tour through the United States and working with him. So um, it was a pretty magical, you know, unfolding, if you will, of the journey but I, I don't know when you ask, like, what is my role in the human design community? I thought, you know, I'm not as old timey as, say, some of the older old timeys. Like, <laughs> I think Chaitan hung out with Rob be- way before me. Uh, I think Richard Rudd did as well. Certainly Marianne Winnegar, um has had a lot, had a long term relationship with Ra. 
uh, Chitanyo and Zeno, Zeno who since passed um, in New Mexico, humandesignsystem.com. They had a very, very long standing relationship. Eleanor Haspel Portner, Noble Life Sciences, she's had a long standing relationship with Ra. So they all came kind of before me. There really isn't a lot. I don't really have, like, I would say that's the, the early group. I don't really have anybody in my level, if you will. Um, I was there when Jovian was born. Mm. Um, and honestly, as soon as Jovian was born, my sacral was like, I'm out of here. Um, mm. <laughs> for a lot of reasons that, the, and this not, this isn't like anti-Jovian. It just was not, I could feel and sense that it wasn't going to be a good fit for me. Um, I had a different background. You know, I was a life coach first. I was trained as a life coach before I even learned human design. I trained with Thomas Leonard before that I was, a a child development specialist, obviously a mom, a nurse, a journalist. <laughs> um, I had sort of a, a crazy quilt of things that I brought to the table. And really for me, what I, you know, in the first few years of being with Human Design America and then eventually being out on my own, I really wanted to use it as a therapeutic tool. And mm -hmm. I could, I couldn't see how, but I could feel it in my bones that this was a tool that had the ability to help us. I'm going to say diagnose and I'm like, please don't come after me. You know, FDA, I'm not saying diagnose in the way that you don't let me say it. I'm just saying you can look at a chart and you can tell where is somebody vulnerable physically, emotionally, you know, uh, spiritually, what are, where is, you know, how do some of these condition themes that people have? And, and let's remember that before raw passed, or, you know, after it wasn't until after Raw passed that this whole science of epigenetics and even neuroplasticity really gained traction. Right. There was a lot he didn't know about the science of conditioning, but mm -hmm. I could feel like there was something in here, some information in here that really could be used to accelerate and amplify people's growth. And and it wasn't going to happen just straight up from a reading that the reading was the beginning not, you know, yeah. it was like, that was the flashpoint, the initiation point in the journey. And what I really was struggling with, especially around 2005, which I think at the same time, was like when the movie, The Secret came out and people really started thinking about deliberate creation. And, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to have been getting Abraham Hicks cassettes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I had a monthly subscription. I got my Abraham Hicks cassette. You know, I was really, I really believe that consciousness and awareness and thinking could create at least your experience of reality. And, um, and the idea of, you know, embracing a dogma of no choice, which was really what Ra taught. And I, I think, I think is a lot of times misinterpreted, but that whole idea of no choice, you have no choice, just, you know, you're either going to be broke or happy. It doesn't matter. You have no choice. <laughs> and I was, I just, my sacral could not it just couldn't resonate with that. It just, I tried, I really did. I tried to be like, shut up, sacral. This is a good opportunity. <laughs> How did um, that go but, for you? <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't let me in. I just, at a certain point, I was just like, uh, -uh I, I can't, I can't do this. I don't resonate with this. I I'm getting clients who are coming in who are deconditioned, even though they didn't know human design and they're mm -hmm. not following their strategy. Like, you know, they, they've done other things to decondition. And also, you know, as a scientist, my own background is in science and understanding science. Yeah. I also knew that the idea of it, all your cells are replaced in seven years is a lie. It's not true. Um, some are, some are, but not all of them. And so what do you do with the ones that didn't get deconditioned? And where's the pattern coming from cellular creation in the first place? Does that pattern go away up to something? I, there was, I had questions about yes, questions. the deconditioning process. And, you know, I, I really wanted to be able to simplify the process of reclaiming your narrative and using it as a platform to accelerate your growth and your potential. And I didn't want to do it with a system that labeled that was, you know, that where people embraced it as labeling. I'm not saying it's a labeling system because I don't think that's how Ra taught it at all, but I saw it being turned into a system where people were labeling themselves and, and basically fixing themselves in a space where I'm a this, therefore I can't do that, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, mm, that's not what it's about. You can do anything. Mm -hmm. 
if you choose to. And you do have choice, <laughs> but you have to know how to have choice. And you have to have choice in a way that's in alignment with you. And you have to heal. And there's no workaround for the healing. There's no magic. Click your heels together three times, say, uh-huh, for seven years and poof, you're deconditioned. Da, da, da. It, it doesn't make sense. Um, so that, that was a very long answer. Again, the question is, no, I don't great. know what I am in that space. I am me. <laughs> so. Well, I love mom, human design mom. It's just so, so beautiful. And I thank you for sharing everything that you just shared. It brings up so many questions and I feel like there are numerous rabbit holes we could go down. Gosh, especially with conscious creation. I'm a huge, I'm a huge Sethi. So I'm, I'm all over that stuff, but we have a huge platform, the biggest platform in the world that we know of for projectors specifically here at the projector mm -hmm. movement. And so I want to be sure to ask you what, what advice do you have for projectors or not necessarily advice, but I would love, and I know our audience would love to hear how you view projectors, especially with our, what can be devastating to hear about wait for the invitation strategy. I, I see you being like, oh, no, that. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear you say anything that you like about projectors and the that strategy and how you work with projectors or, you know, anything that might be helpful to us <laughs> waiters. We're all waiters, even manifestors uh -huh. wait. Let's let's be clear. So that's the other piece. When we talk about manifestors you don't have to wait. Yeah, you do. You just have to wait for inner alignment. Um, so um, so here's what I there's so much to unpack there. You know, I, I would say I'll start with I'll start with first of all, I'm madly in love with the projector. You know, <laughs> I, and and that projector is my 13-year-old daughter. Um, she's my only projector child. I have a projector stepdaughter as well, um, but I didn't get to raise her from the beginning. I, I've had, I'm going to cry when I say this. I mean, I feel like I've had the privilege to raise a projector and it really has been a privilege. I mean, what an extraordinary human being she is with her innate understanding of the world. So I'll start there and I'll add in conjunction with that, I'll add that in the first 10 years of my practice, I probably had three generator readings. Every reading I did, every per client I worked with was a projector, which I thought has, was really an interesting fractal for me. Um, so as I said, I've had the privilege of raising a projector and what I saw, I'm, just, I'm sorry, Karen, I'm going to interrupt you for a second, yeah. because I'm pretty sure all projectors are weeping right now, knowing that you consciously raised a projector. And that's something that we all wish that we had. So yeah. Thanks. Now you're going to make me cry. I know, it's, um, it's really <laughs> tender because, because I've, you know, in those 10 years of listening to people share their story, because I like to do reading. I like to call my readings catalytic conversations. And I like to let my clients talk in the beginning, because otherwise, where am I going to go with the reading? I need to customize it as a manifesting generator. I need to respond to what they need. Right. And so I have heard, I have listened to for years and years and years and years, these heartbreaking projector stories to, you know, you you come in, they come in, you'll look at the chart and you're like, wow, that's unbelievable. Who, what cosmic force put this thing together? What an amazing collection of archetypes, right? And who would have thought, right? And then you hear these stories of, I'll call you, I'll call them broken projectors. I hate that term, but, mm -hmm. you know, but projectors who really felt broken and really were asking the question, not who am I and what am I here to do? They were asking the question, what's wrong with me? And human, you know, to watch in the experience of just doing a reading, to watch a projector say, oh my God, this explains everything. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with me. The world doesn't get me. I'm not the problem, right? And so, um, you know, when I found out that my baby was a projector, uh, uh, you know, she, she was four weeks late. So I was pregnant with her. Like every like two hours, I was running the chart. Like, okay, it's, if it's born now, it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> out. And then it was like, I, we went through this long, like two week cycle of projector transits. And I was like, no, it's going to be so hard. And I'm going to screw it up. And just, uh, my sacral is going to kill her. <laughs> and, um, but she was born a projector. And uh, 
She's an interesting projector. She's an eight and one projector. So she only has the sacral open. So she's quite a powerhouse. Um, <laughs> but, you know, she was born. She she came out and I, I put her to the breast and literally she looked up at me like, we got this. And in that moment, oh. I thought, okay, we're going to be okay. You know, we're going to be okay. And so I, as I said, I have had this privilege of watching a natural projector unfold. What that translated to very quickly was somewhere around 18 months, this child would go outside on the balcony of the apartment we were staying in and yell things from the balcony to the people below. She would yell things like, hey, why aren't you wearing a helmet? Don't you know you need to be wearing a helmet if you're going to ride a bike? That's not good for you. And we'd be in the car and she'd (laughs) roll down the back window and she'd yell out in this little baby voice, you need to stop smoking, smoking. I was like, crap, I'm going to have to lock the windows in, in the back of the car because she's somebody's getting mad at us. <laughs> this person <laughs> screaming corrections out of the back seat of the car. But, you know, I was like, oh my God, this projector thing, it's like, it's, it's just, it's so natural. It's not like you've been repressed and repressed and pressed and finally you get to express your opinion. It's like she could see already as this teeny tiny little person, like, y'all, you, y'all get it together here. You need to do this and you need to do that. (laughs) And so, um, you know, I knew right away, fortunately, because I'd been well-schooled that I needed to make sure that uh, in the long game of parenting, because parenting is a long game, in the long game of parenting, I started to, you know, really give her the message that what you have to offer is rare and it's precious And it's transformative. Now she has 4323 in her conscious sun earth. So she's um, already kind of a little interesting. Um, And she's a fifth line. So she's also (laughs) interesting in that way too. Um, And, you know, giving her that message over and over again of you're not for everyone. What you have is available only for the people who see it, who call it out of you, who recognize it. Don't waste it on people who don't see it and don't be hurt if they don't see it. It's not about you. They're not ready yet. They're not ready yet. She's 13. That's probably, I think we're right in the major trial zone of this uh, uh, journey because 13 is hell, especially I think for girls, honestly, I don't, th- middle school girls are the worst. Um, I will say that you know, she also has, the, her moon is highlighting the 19. Um, so she's got a lot of sensitivity as a middle school kid in, in during COVID times, her school was two blocks where George Floyd was killed. Oh. Um, you know, she's been very, I, I always joke, you know, and I say this of all the projectors, when the planet lurches, you all feel it. And, yeah. you know, she has been in the last, and we were living in a city before we moved out into the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, um, which I love uh, and she loves, <laughs> um, but um she was coming home from school and saying, mom, I just couldn't today. I went out to the playground and I just, I just had to lie down on the ground. And she said that that was the only way I could just get back to myself. I was just Mm -hmm. feeling it all. And I, I started to get really clear that she was not just living the life of the projector in a middle school classroom, but She was also feeling and sensing the disruption in the city and the disruption from COVID and all the other stuff that was going on. And it was just overwhelming her. So um, we moved her out into the country to a much smaller place with less intensity. And she's thriving here. Um, Oh, good. It's a good good piece. Bottom line is you don't need to hold. I'm I'm talking about one of my favorite people in the world. No, um, this is so (laughs) wonderful. And I'm sure parents, projector parents and parents of projectors are delighting right now. I mean, I'd love to keep hearing you talk about parenting your projector and just everything that you just said about your daughter really feeling the world, especially in these turbulent times. I know we can all really relate to that. And it it feels amazing for someone else to to see that. I think mm-hmm. that's so huge. And it, the environment impacts us so much and the psychic environment. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, please just continue. I, <laughs> so, well, so here's some other things we learned about projectors. So I, my husband is 15 years older than me. So he was raised in the 1950s. Um, and so we have, as co-parents, oftentimes grappled with parenting 
a difference in parenting philosophies. So, um, you know, he still comes from, and, and he's not there yet, but he has to combat this on the daily, this whole idea of like, you need to form your children and you're the expert mm-hmm. and you tell your kids what is and what isn't. And so, you know, interestingly and ironically enough, he gives birth to this power. I mean, I gave birth, but he was there, uh, mm-hmm. this powerhouse of a projector human. And basically sh- from a very early age, she's telling him, dad, why are you doing that? You know, you, if you just did this, it would be so much easier. And he's like, why are you telling me this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and how do you know this? And, you know, it's been interesting to watch him, you know, for me to have to school him on zip it, <laughs> zip it, dude, and let her tell you what she needs to say. Cause if you actually listened, there's probably something in there for you. Um, and of course there is. And obviously some of it's from a child through the eyes of a child, but you know, the level of perception and awareness that comes out of this kid's mouth is gobsmackingly difficult um, sometimes because it's so raw and so true. I mean, her her teacher, part of, again, back to school, just, you know, her teacher in the school where she was in, you know, she would come home and say, I won't say his name, but Mr. Smith, we'll call him Mr. Smith, um, you know, Mr. Smith, you know, if Mr. Smith doesn't deal with his unconscious, you know, sense of inadequacy, he's never going to be able to guide us in this classroom. And, you know, she said that that's just contagious. Everybody else is already also feeling inflamed and anxious and, and inadequate. And it's just creating a milieu that's just wildly dysfunctional. And, you know, and she would bring these, these make these Boom. dinner table and you'd be like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Um, and, and you're like, well, what do I do? Like, do I go back to the teacher and say, dude, you need some therapy? Um, my daughter is exploring, you know, the theme of inadequacy that's rolling through your life right now. And it's affecting it, you know, you know, I don't know what to do. Right. Um, and, you know, she would launch these massive campaigns against usually against the teacher, um, but in a helpful way. Like she decided that the undercurrent of uh, of sexism in the classroom was being reflected through the literature choices for read aloud time. And so she would bring extra bonus books to Mr. Smith um, because these were more feminist based books and, you know, really suited the environment of the classroom better. Of course, he never took her suggestions and she was horribly mad uh, and bitter, if you want to call it that. Um, I think the other piece that has been really interesting to witness beyond just, as I said, her natural understanding of what's possible and looking at, she, she can look at anything and know what's the potential mm. and what's blocking the potential and has no qualms articulating it in a very beautiful way. Um, I think the other piece for her though was, has been helping her regulate her energy. Um, not just the sensitivity piece, but just recognizing that for a kid, a, a projector, particularly a projector with a defined will, mm-hmm. going to school Monday through Friday, was very challenging. It was exhausting. And um, I, we started to really see that that Friday night was just, it was a predictable meltdown every Friday. It's just at the, and, and it started like in kindergarten, that Fridays were just, we dreaded Fridays. Fridays were not fun. We couldn't have a family meal. We couldn't enjoy each other's company. It was just a meltdown. And you know, we, I finally, I finally thought, you know, what she really needs is a day off <laughs> and like, how do you give a kid a day off? Right. And of course, remember I'm dealing with my 1950s husband who's like, what does a kid need a day off? Kids don't have any obligations and responsibilities. <laughs> I'm like, no, honey, <laughs> being in the world is hard for a projector and being in a world where you have to sit in a classroom and you're sitting there going, this is bogus. This whole system is dysfunctional. I mean, that's her, that was what she started saying in first grade. Like, I'm just going to take this school system down. This is not work. This who, who <laughs> came up with this idea, right? How they relate to that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I find it's like, honey, I think what's happening here is like, you're exhausted. And she's like, yeah, I just want, I don't want to go anywhere on the weekend. I just want to be in my pajamas. So we finally engineered this, this idea that Saturday is pajama day. For her and still to this day saturday is pajama day and so nothing nothing gets scheduled on saturday it is a religious religious day for her in the sense that saturday is pajama day we bring her breakfast in bed on saturday we bring her lunch yes. you know <laughs> she doesn't have to go anywhere do anything and um if we want to talk to her we go to her room we try not to stay in there too long because she's you know she's doing her own thing and it's really it's really important 
to see how that grounds her and keeps her going. Um, because if she doesn't get it and sometimes she does it. So like right now she's doing a school play and there's a, you know, there's a lot of after school practice and there's, you know, there's plays, you know, the show is on Fridays and Saturdays. We, I already know like, okay, come Sunday after this, you know, we're probably gonna have to take Sunday off and maybe Monday or Tuesday as a mental health day after that, because her energy just has cycles that way. And, and, and she has to, you know, I, I want to raise her in such a way that she has sovereignty over her own energetic cycles. And I don't want her to buy into the idea of like, right now, all of her friends are starting to get jobs at fast food restaurants. And she's like, should I go get a job? I'm like, no, 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 you're not doing that. And, and just recognizing, I mean, just even watching her kind of click into the idea. So this is a weird side angle for half a second. She loves to felt. She does these oh, amazing cool. felt sculptures, really? like mind blowing, uh, mind blowing felt stuff. sculptures. And okay. I um, see them. oh, I have some uh, okay, on my shelf me. behind me. <laughs> and um, so she came up with the idea. She said, "Well, maybe instead of getting a job at a fast food place, we we live two blocks from a wool shop." <laughs> and so she, she said, "Why don't I go to the wool shop?" And I'll ask them if I can teach a felting workshop here in the summer. And they were like all over it. So now in the summer, instead of working at a fast food place, she's going to be teaching felting. She's educating, right? She's a projector. She's oh, fulfilling her role. And, and she's so excited. And you can see her energy is just on, on, on. And I will tell you, I gave her the idea, but she did go to the store and bring it up and initiate it. And mm. technically that's wrong, but is it, you know, is it, I, I think I, I have questions about the sit still be quiet, wait until hopefully somebody notices you. It seems like such a waste if you really have the keys to the kingdom as you do as a projector to at least under certain circumstances, not be able to say, Hey, I have an idea. Is it okay with you if I share it? Because if you're just sitting there hoping, basically you're hoping that people who oftentimes have their own issues their own with their own sense of self-worth or their need to be right or their own need to be seen, who aren't going to be able to let go and let you guide because they're not there yet. And maybe mm -hmm. they need a little bit of an opening. And um, I will just say as a mother <laughs> of a projector, if people don't ask her, they're missing out. And, and I mean that I feel that way about almost all projectors I encounter. If people don't ask you, they're missing out. That's on them, not you. And um, I, I just, I would like to get our projectors activated and I would like to get the planet in sync with that activation because we'll all benefit. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. That's what, that's what we're trying to do here at the projector movement is just provide resources for projectors to awaken to what's going on and, and be in their full power for, for the good of, for the good of all as the guides that we're meant to be. And I'm, I'm so curious about, I mean, the whole invitation, waiting for the invitation and waiting for recognition and the invitation is fascinating and difficult, I think, for all of us. I'm really curious what you think about that, especially just with what you just said. And I know in my own life, um, I have succeeded through initiating, but it has been more like, yeah, I want to reach out to this person just to let them know what I'm up to because I think they might be really into it. And then sometimes mm -hmm. they are and sometimes they're not. And I, it's not something that causes bitterness for me if they don't pick up that thread. But I have, I have like been like, hey, here I am doing this thing just mm -hmm. by the way. And sometimes mm -hmm. that has caused uh, just the most amazing things to happen in my life. Um, but with, yeah, what do you think about what, what is an invitation and is it, what do you think about these inner, inner alignment sort of invitations, like invitations from your dreaming or your higher self or, or things like that. And also this is just a wide, wild question for you. <laughs> um, it's not a very good generator yes no kind of thing it's okay but, i'm tracking <laughs> yeah no I, I i'm really enjoying this conversation i have so many questions for you but what yeah what do you think about the invitation thing and then also just about projectors in general i know that you call them orchestrators and yeah just just opening it up for anything in that realm i would love to hear what 
what your thoughts are. So I, I want to start. Okay. I need to probably take a note for myself because I'm, <laughs> what I'm going to say. So I, I want to start first with just the, the whole strategy piece mm -hmm. and, and I may get in trouble for this, but you know, I, I'm probably the renegade human design mom. Um, okay. No one, <laughs> no one give, no one give Karen any, any flack here. <laughs> um, uh, so the first thing that I want to say is when Ra was first given the information from the voice and when he taught, he was told that this is for the not self. So the mm -hmm. entire traditional human design system is designed to initiate slash shatter. That was Ra's word, shatter the not self. And Ra always talked about how eventually he would address the awakened human, that he would rewrite the I Ching and create an awakened rave I Ching, mm -hmm. which he never got to do because he, he died before he did. Now, I always teach that, first of all, all types wait, as I said, even project, even manifestors, manifestors have to wait for inner alignment or signs and clues and, and signals in their own way. Obviously, generators have to wait to respond. Projectors have to wait for the recognition of the invitation. Reflectors have to wait the 28 days. The fact that waiting is built into the deconditioning process is paramount. And I don't always think that the end result is that now you live all the time following your strategy once you deconditioned. Mm -hmm. That that waiting part of everyone's strategy is about getting you to slow down enough to connect to your inner wisdom, getting you to be present to what's showing up, to start really feeling like, oh, where's that landing in my body? You know, a lot of, I think human design is about getting below the neck, right? Where is that landing in my body? How does that intuitively feel to me? What is my gut saying about this? You know, am I getting chills on my skin? Is this an invitation or, or something to respond to that's triggering my old story of low self-worth? Do I really need to follow this thread? You know, it's, there's a grace in the idea of giving us seven years in this traditional human design journey of deconditioning, seven years of going, oh, hold up. If I'm going to reclaim control over the space between stimulus and response, which is really what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to stop reacting with an old response to the same stimulus, then I have to stop and drop into a different space from which I make my decisions and my choices. And so that waiting piece, I think, isn't always, I'm hesitant to say this because there's so much merit in waiting and following strategy in the beginning, totally. Mm -hmm. But there comes a time when, because you waited, you start to remember what the cadence of your inner wisdom sounds like inside your head. You start to remember what it feels like to have the cosmic plan and cosmic order roll through you. And you have a sense of, oh, this is my next right step because this is my place in the unfolding of this divine plan, if you will. And you start to have a different way of knowing what's the next step. You know, if we look at, if we take a big, big step back outside of the human design world and we look at physics, we know that the cosmos is inherently organized, that syntropy is actually natural. Entropy, not so much, unless we're coming to the end of our physical life. But syntropy is the norm, and Can that you the tell universe... us what syntropy means for those. Sorry, who don't know. Yeah. <laughs> syntropy is organized, coherent movement towards greater states of organization, evolution, mm. if you will. Syntropy is normal. We're we are an evolving aspect of the cosmos, and so it is natural for us through our own holographic lives, if you will, our micro microcosmic expressions of the divine in our lives. It's normal for us as we decondition to start living towards the fulfillment of our potential and through synthropy and for us to be living connected to that wisdom that is inside of us. We have that wisdom as kids go back. I go back and look at my 18 month old baby who knew like what, she, what she needed to be doing from the backseat of that car. I'm here to manage the world. That's my job, right? Mm -hmm. I'm here to help people maximize their potential. 
potential. And so I do think that if we wait, we learn to wait so that we can better hear ourselves, our real our real voice, our authentic voice inside our heads, the cadence of that goodness that's in there. And I would also argue in conjunction with that, we do more than just wait. We also have to look at where are all those places in my ancestral lineage and in my personal story where I've internalized the idea that it's not okay for me to be who I am and how I am. And when we clear those stories, then we become a natural extension of the cosmic plan, if you will. And we know what needs to happen next. And so when you are in the shower and that thing drops in, right. And you're like, Oh, this is what I need to be doing. Now. You know, that feels different mm-hmm. than that frenetic, like, Oh, I could do this and I could do that. And I could do this. That comes from conditioned states. Right. But when you drop into that, this is who I am. I'm authentically aligned. I'm in this pure space of being who I am. I'm syntropic in my existence. I'm, I'm present. I'm, I'm not frenetic. I'm not proving my value. I'm not under pressure. When you can be in that space, then there's nothing to wait for. There's just you being in the flow of that plan unfolding as part of you being in service to something greater than yourself. So, you know, I, I always have a little cautionary note on there that says, you know, if you're going to decide, Hey, I'm not going to wait anymore, do it with great awareness of I've done my work and I trust Mm -hmm. myself, which is, I think, inherent in that I trust myself. I trust source. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready to follow those internal directives now. Um, But it does take, I think it takes an active intent to decondition to get you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's such a huge difference between the kind of chattering monkey mind that's speaking from the not self and all of that, how we normally look at the mind in human design. There's such a difference between that and the mind that's actually, after you've done a lot of your work and you're not grappling with those same things when those voices are actually quieter and your mind is more in service of your higher self and pulling out those threads. I'm so glad that you mentioned that Ra originally delivered human design for the not self like that is so hugely important and the next big chunk which is i know the one that you're really here working on is speaking to the actual true person who's more of a human creature moving through the world as as the creature that we're meant to be as more like animals that are integrated in the whole but with our like specific human individual piece in there i could just talk about this for hours but this is great. <laughs> but okay, I'll, I'll let me stop myself for a second. Um, so I have to go back to part B of that of the first yeah, question that you do. asked. Is, Absolutely. I'm, I'm wondering if I can do that. Is that good? Please. Okay. All right. So so the second thing was okay. Well, what about projectors and recognition? Mm-hmm. And so the first thing I would say is, I find that for projectors, because of how our culture that still deeply ties value to work and work to money, and work to effort and hustle, that and energy and, and busyness to value, that, you know, before a projector can say, okay, I'm going to drop this whole waiting for recognition thing, it's bogus. Um, <laughs> before you can do that, you really have to go back and explore your self-worth. I think Mm self-worth is like the thing for healthy projectors. And that if you don't create, or if you don't heal the karma of a low self-worth, it positions you in such a place where if you are pushing, you're going to push with energy you don't have, and you're not going to get hurt Mm -hmm. because you're not valuing yourself first. And that's what's being created energetically out in the world. How are other people going to value if you don't value yourself first? And you're basically giving up the goods to people who don't see the value of it because you don't see the value of it. You're not going to accept the right invitations, which translates to you're not going to say no to the wrong invitations because you're going to be so excited that you've got an invitation. (laughs) You're going to put your energy somewhere that's not correct. (laughs) Right? Yeah. And and you're not going to allow yourself to rest if you need to rest. And so when we look at the chart and we look at where self-worth lives in the chart, self-worth primarily lives in the will center. 
And if we look at the gate 26, which I call a gate of integrity in quantum human design, mm -hmm. we see that in the gate, that gate, first of all, physiologically, we have the thymus. So we got B cells, T cells, we've got um, immune response, which actually is a huge, big collective theme we've been grappling with since COVID started. So yeah. COVID, you know, COVID, if you, if you go back and you look at, I wrote a little tiny book called human design in the COVID-19. Oh. I talk about the theme of the COVID virus is about alignment and integrity and that that collectively the purpose of COVID, you know, all, all I used to teach at pandemic start when the sun hits the gate 44, which mm. is, you know, the electromagnetic to the 26. So we are being given through a pandemic, the opportunity to unwind ourselves from the patterns of the past and patterns that cause us to create out of integrity with our value. Now I teach that integrity in the gate 26 has five different expressions. The first one is uh, physical integrity. So if we don't value ourselves, we get out of physical integrity with ourselves. We don't take care of the body. Right. And of course this goes the other way around too. If you get, a, if something happens to your body, it can affect your self-worth. The second integrity is resource integrity. So we get out of integrity with the way we use our resources, including time, including money, mm -hmm. or we use our resources to try to prove our value. I have this beautiful purse. I don't get the purse thing uh, personally, but, but you know, yeah. I have this beautiful $2,000 purse. Look at how valuable I am in the world, right? The third level of integrity is called identity integrity. We start compromising who we are in the world because we think I don't have enough value in me, myself. So I'm going to construct this massive facade and I'm going to burn myself out ultimately because there's burnout associated with low self-worth, right? I'm going to burn myself out trying to be someone I'm not because I don't think it's valuable for me to be who I am. Moral integrity is, of course, the next one. I don't need to go into that. But, you know, obviously, if you don't think you're enough, you're going to do sketchy things to try to get enough. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is energetic integrity. So you get out of energetic integrity with yourself and with your commitments. And so for projectors, that integrity place is really vulnerable and, yeah. and very important because if you're out of integrity, because your self-worth is not strong, because there's such a relationship between value, money, work, hustle, self-worth. You know, if you don't heal that first as a projector, it just puts you in this whole never ending spiral of boom and bust energy cycles and money cycles and all kinds of health issues. I'm not doing saying this it's causative. I'm saying it's correlative mm -hmm. and you won't get, you won't get recognized for what you want to be recognized for if you're out of integrity with yourself, first and foremost. So I think for the, for the projector, the number one thing to do to get yourself to a space where you are getting good invitations or things are starting to feel like there's movement has to start first with a high sense of self-worth. And the other piece about that high sense of self-worth is that if you then start to say, oh, I don't know what's going on here, but this, I need to initiate this person. I need to say something because, you know, I'm getting the splenic response or I'm my, my projector's bitey sense is saying this person needs something. If you offer up the insights that you have and they're like, what is your deal? What, why, why, why go away. Right. If your self-worth is intact, you'll know, oh, they weren't ready yet. And it doesn't become, oh, there's just one more person telling mm. me, sit down, you know? Yeah. So you just mentioned projector spidey sense. Do you think that's <laughs> something that all projectors have, or do you correlate that with, is that, is that based on how the energy field is around the projector with the absorbing of other people's energy or how would you describe the projector spidey sense is as okay, a, so, so now you have to, so first of all, that's a thing. <laughs> I don't, I don't, the whole projector, whatever aura type thing. I don't buy yeah. any of that. Okay. Um, oh. I don't think there's science to back that up. The aura um, in general, the aura. Yeah, field. I mean, the, okay. the, yeah. and and it really sort of downplays frequencies in general. So I have to mm -hmm. just say this because I hear people talk about this a lot. And, oh, great! And no, go for it. Frequency. If we go back to remembering, not even quantum physics, basic physics from high school. Mm -hmm. Frequencies modulate. Lower frequencies cannot entrain higher frequencies. So if you walk in in a low frequency state, you can't pull the people who are in a high frequency state down to your level. Right. High frequency energies entrain lower. If you walk in in a high frequency state, you're going to pull people up. Not only that, you're going to be more attractive. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, you're going to be programming your monopole, which is rooted in your sense of value and your sense of lovability because it's in that G thing in the heart chakra area, right? Your monopole is going to be pulling people in who match your frequency or who are eager to be aligned with your frequency. And so all this conversation about who this person has a repelling aura and this person, it doesn't make any sense. Take good care of your frequency, live true to who you are, love yourself, respect yourself, value yourself, keep your frequency high, be honest about who you are in the world. People will be drawn to you no matter what your type, because people want that. It's a high frequency state. They're compelled to follow it. You will be the one that regulates the room. So, um, so, but as far as projector spidey sense, totally you know, the gift of the projector. And, and this thing shows up in a couple of different places in the chart. And you can hear it in the language. We talk about the projected field of the fifth line and to a certain mm-hmm. degree, the second line. We talk about projected elements in the chart, like the 1858, for example. Projected elements and the projector, their gift is their ability to see the potential. Mm-hmm. It's natural. It's like, you can't not. That's what a projected energy field is. And you are a projected energy field. So it's natural for you as a projector. You walk into any field, you're like, oh, I see the potential. It could be this, 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 and this. And the other piece, I mean, I would say some of it, I think is part of the open sacral can also be sometimes open G. I think that all the open sacral types have that to a certain degree. I think the one thing the projector has that the other types don't is the understanding of what needs to happen to fulfill that potential. Mm. And that's their role is I see the potential and I know how to orchestrate it, which is why I like the phrase orchestrator. I know how to orchestrate it either energetically or literally with my voice and my actions. I know how to orchestrate it so that it gets fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. I love the, I know that labels are, isn't the right thing, but I mean the word, I love the words that you've chosen very deliberately to describe the energy types or whatever, you know, all all the various things in quantum human design orchestrator. So your new word for projector is orchestrator for those that don't know. And Mm -hmm. I think that is so beautiful because of the reason that you just said seeing potential and knowing what to do with it. But also to me, it really, it really evokes this acoustical orchestra like an orchestra Mm -hmm. of music and I feel like something so important for everyone but particularly projectors is to like really sink into those things that delight us and you know really get to know ourselves through the things that we enjoy and just the having the word orchestrator just makes me makes me feel seen (laughs) way more than projector which I can get in another kind of abstract level because I also like projecting my inner self out into the world and making that happen is like kind of how I deal Mm -hmm. with the word projector a bit, but um, I just love orchestrator. And I'm I'm just really wondering if I know we need to wrap up soon, unfortunately, but would you like to describe, would you mind saying the different, the new, I know it's not new anymore, but the new words for the various types and kind of that, I think we would love that. So the manifester is the initiator. Mm-hmm. So the, the manifester has this direct connection to the, the quantum pulse that, that transcends language. And so when they follow their internal nonverbal creative flow, that electric spark, they initiate others into that same electric connection to source. Mm. The generators, what I call pure generators, the alchemists, they are here to become the experts at being human. And it's through the, the journey of learning how to learn that they become alchemical in their ability to translate inspiration into form and action. Mm-hmm. The time benders, same theme as the generators and, and to a certain degree, you know, the manifestors, if you will, or the initiators and the alchemists, the time benders, though, have a role of shortcutting the creative process. And through that electrical nonverbal creative flow that they have with the cosmic field and that need to still step it down and do that whole learning how to learn process, they learn how to learn, but also how to transcend the steps to find the fastest, quickest way of creating. And these, and of course, are manifesting generators. Manifesting generators. I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, manifesting yeah. generators. Yeah. But awesome. as you said, the projectors are the orchestrators. I, I, I want to cover this really quickly in a little bit yeah. more for your orchestrators, be, just because I want you to know where this came from. Mm-hmm. Um, the, as always, it was the orchestrators that initiated me. Um, so 
I kept getting over the years, clients, I mean, projector clients over and over again saying, I'm not doing anything. I'm just laying on the couch and I'm exhausted and I feel everything on the planet and I'm exhausted. And when I go to sleep, I dream about Korea and I wake up and I'm exhausted and I go to sleep and I dream about working on the grid and I'm exhausted. And I don't know why, because I'm not doing anything. And I just really got clear that there are a lot of projectors on this planet who are not doing anything by laying on a couch who are actually holding together this entire subtle body template of the planet, the energy grid of the planet. And so, yeah, I love the theme that you just said about the orchestrator because I see, you know, to me, sound is frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so the orchestrator is really literally orchestrating a symphony of frequencies on the planet, basically holding us all together so that we don't blow ourselves up to a certain degree and (sighs) holding the template of the future. It's like you can see the potential. So you're basically holding this energy field together while the rest of us catch up and do the third dimensional work necessary to bring it into form. So that was really what my motivation for really changing that language and putting in the description of the projector, the idea that you never don't do anything, that your very existence is holding the entire planet together. And if you're tired from doing that, of course you are. Go look at the news. Do you know what you're having to combat on a daily basis from the couch? It's crazy. So, yeah. Um, and then our reflector becomes. Okay, I'm sorry. I'd have to just stop. You. Take <laughs> okay. that in. Take that in, projectors, orchestrators, what Karen just said, and just really feel into that and that someone else just recognized you all for that because that's just so huge. I just, I just needed to highlight that. Yeah. So thank you yeah. all for doing that. So, cause if, if trust me, if the manifesting generators were in charge, we'd be in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then our calibrators of course become the metric of, you know, mm. how well are we doing? Where are we on this evolutionary scale? You know, the calibrator walks into the room And they're not just walking in with only an open sacral. They're walking into the room with nine open centers, knowing exactly what the potential is. It's not their job to build it. It's their job to reflect it back and going, guys, you know, on a scale of, you know, zero to 10, we're at a three. (laughs) And, and let me show you what that looks like. And so, um, and, and ultimately learning how to be in that field and speak to the field without actually becoming the field. And that's, that's a tricky challenge. I think sometimes of the calibrator is, learning to recognize I'm at home within myself and this environment feels like this and I'm going to embody it for a short period of time without recognize and and understand that I'm not this field, but this is what this field is. And it's, I'm demonstrating it through me. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Karen, it's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you. I could continue this for about three hours. I, I want to <laughs> respect your time. And um, we'll definitely be sharing below here the links to visit your work and your books. And just I encourage everyone to check out Karen's work. And we're just, again, so grateful to have you on this on this podcast for for our projector orchestrators, I know we're going to get a lot of feedback about how impactful this has been to us, um, to us all. And just, just so much gratitude for you and and the work that you're doing in the world. Is there anything that you'd like to share about um, anything upcoming or just anything like um, that? You know, I, I would say that if you really resonated with some of what I talked about today, um, I do have a new book out. It's, it's really a reference guide. It's a pretty hefty, I I can show you, but you're on zoom and we're not using video, but it's a pretty hefty guide. Um, It's a, Oh, great. It's called the encyclopedia of quantum human design. And basically it breaks down all the elements of traditional human design and reframes the higher, the higher potential of the archetypes from traditional human design. So I don't want to call it the awakened Ray V Ching because that was raw. Mm -hmm. That was Ra's word words, but definitely I will say that I was very guided throughout the years to really codify a higher frequency of language so that we could better speak into the the gifts and the brilliance that each and every one of us bring to the table in in in, in all of our unique ways. So amazing. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>